Chapter 27 is about wave optics here and we are going to be applying the wave model to light and we're going to be studying interference and diffraction and we'll start off with interference of light waves. Now just a little bit of history, Newton uh, was not a believer of wave theory. Uh, he often argued with scientists such as Robert Hooke and the Dutch scientist Christian Huygens uh, who believed that light was more like a wave and Newton did not believe it was wave-like. Wave he believed they were like tiny little particles flying through the air uh, which he called corpuscles. However, we know today that light behaves both as a particle and as a wave. And so this chapter is about the wave nature of light. Uh, so we're going to first start off by giving some definitions. We have monochromatic and monochromatic you could think mono as single and chromatic color so it's light of a single color or constant frequency or single wavelength. Uh, a good source that provides monochromatic light is a laser. Uh, another term that's down at the bottom of the page is called coherent sources and two sources are coherent if they maintain a constant phase relationship. Let me draw a little picture to show you what I mean here. So here's a picture of an incoherent source, incoherent light that would come from something like a common uh, lamp. And if you look carefully you'll see that they're all different frequencies. You got this green and the red one and uh, they're not obviously in phase with one another. So let's take a look at something that would be considered coherent. And a coherent source would look something like this where we have um, all these light waves look like they're exactly in phase with each other. They have the same frequency and um, they're all going crest to crest, trough to trough. An example of that would be from a laser. And you'll see they're all the same frequency so there will be no interference. So now let's discuss interference at the top of the page. And any, any situation where two or more waves overlap in the same place at the same time is called interference. Uh, so we have two types of interference, constructive interference, and you can see here that there's two sources, Y1 and Y2, and we can see we're getting constructive interference. You'll look at it, if you look carefully, you'll see that the crests add together and the troughs add together, and they their individual effects add and produce a larger wave. Uh, so the path difference for this to occur between L1 and L2, you can see source 2 travels a little bit extra distance. It must be off by a whole multiple of a wavelength. So one wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths, or no wavelengths at all will produce constructive interference. And also, when you look at these waves, they will add up algebraically. This is by the principle of superposition. So if you have Y1 and Y2, the final wave that you get is really just the sum of the individual displacements or amplitude. Then let's consider looking at destructive interference. Destructive interference is when two waves arrive at exactly half a cycle off from one another. So when one crest of one wave meets with the trough of another wave and they destructively interfere with each other. And so their individual effects are essentially reduced to nothing. Now when we studied this with sound, we didn't hear any sound here. And then when we were dealing with constructive interference, you would have a large sound. Now when we look at light, then this will be basically bright light and then over here will be basically dark. But the same effects is true, exactly what you would get with a water wave or with a light wave or with a sound wave, it's all the same thing. Now scientists at the time of Newton uh, believed predominantly in Newton's theory was correct that he believed that light was just particle-like. And it wasn't until 1801 that a young British physicist named Thomas Young uh, came up with a very famous experiment called the double slit experiment. Now let's turn to the page and look at that. Thomas Young performed an experiment um, w w using monochromatic light. So remember monochromatic means single color, um, which was directed to uh, one single slit, which then went through two very closely spaced slits. And then on this screen over here, it was observed that you had bright and dark 
fringes all along on the screen. And he realized these bright fringes of light resulted from light waves from both holes arriving at, in phase with each other, producing constructive interference. And the dark fringes were due to when a, the one, light from one source and the other source were meeting out of phase with one another and producing a dark area from destructive interference, which is no light. This experiment produced convincingly showed scientists of the day that light has wave-like properties. And so this brought in a whole new theory about light, that light can behave not just like a particle, but as a wave. This experiment is traditionally done with a pair of slits, uh, and each slit has a width of approximately 0.1 millimeters, the slit opening here and here, and the distance between slit 1 and slit 2 are traditionally usually about 0.5 millimeters apart. Um, and this allowed light to behave like a wave. And you can see from here, there's one wave over here, and there's another wave from slit 2, and these are going to constructively and destructively interfere and produce these bright and dark bands or fringes. The pattern that is observed on the screen is called an interference pattern, and the bright, bright band in the middle is called the central maximum. And then on either side, we call this these different order numbers. So this would be called m equals 1. Sometimes people will call positive 1 and negative 1. And this is m equal 2 equals 2, and this is the second order, and you can continue this as long as how many fringes that you will see. So this is the whole interference pattern consisting of fringes. Now let's dive in a little bit deeper into the interference of light waves and analyze the interference pattern to show this equation that's down below here. We have light coming from two sources, S1 and S2, arrive at this point P. This point P makes an angle with the screen. So there you can see there's angle theta here. And it's also the same angle that is made over here that we'll be discussing with this path difference. You'll see that triangle in a little bit. The light that comes from these two sources come either in phase or out of phase at point P, depending on whether it's constructive or destructive interference, whether we see something that is either bright or dark. So uh, let's draw in the waves to get an idea here. These two waves travel a different distance. We have the little green wave that I've shown in here, which we call that path, either you can call it R1 and R2 here, or L1 and L2, depending on your notation. But as you can see, the path that slit 2 took versus the path that slit 1 took, they differ in paths, which means they could be in phase or out of phase, depending on the scenario. We call that extra distance that S2 has to travel, we call that the path difference. So you can call it either delta R or delta D, uh, whatever it works for you. I'm going to use, an, as is shown in here, delta R, because there's R2 and R1. So delta R is the extra distance R2 has to travel compared to R1. And highlighted in here, you can see a little bit of a triangle drawn in here. Let's draw that triangle larger. So here I've redrawn this smaller triangle, quite large here. This represents delta R, uh, and this is the distance between the slits, D, along here, the hypotenuse of the triangle, and this angle here is theta. And so you can see that sine of theta is equal to delta R all over D. So therefore, delta R is equal to D sine theta, and that's what's shown over here. The path difference is equal to d times sine theta. And similarly, we can make another triangle shown over here. And so I've taken this triangle over here and drawn it over here so that there's the right angle. This distance r, which is the distance from the slits to the screen, is listed as r, but we're going to change that to an l, which is consistent with the AP notation. So this is L, the distance from the slits to the screen, roughly. And then this distance, which is labeled as Y, we're going to change that to X, which is also consistent. This is the distance from the central fringe, central maximum, to say this first bright fringe, if this is considered P. So that's the distance along the screen, and that is X. And this angle is also theta. And so you can write another trig formula here and write tan theta is equal to x all over l. 
Okay, and we'll be using this information in a minute. Let's look at constructive interference. You recall, hopefully, from before when we studied constructive interference between waves that were in phase with one another, that their path difference, uh, delta r, must be equal to whole integer multiples of the wavelength. So in this case, we just showed that the path difference is equal to d sine theta. So now we can replace delta r with d sine theta is equal to m lambda. m is known as the order number, so it depends on which one you want to see, whether it's the first order or the second order, as uh, shown up here, m1 or m2. For destructive interference, you would want it to be off by a multiple of a half a wavelength. So we have now, you could rewrite this, I suppose, as delta r is equal to m plus a half times lambda. And again, we're replacing the path difference with d sine theta, and you get this formula. Now, the one on the formula sheet is this d sine theta equals m lambda, because we typically are looking for the bright spots on the screen. So you can use this formula without any proof. Now, there is a simpl simplification we can use because normally when we are dealing with situations with interference of double slits, the distance at the screen is uh, from the slits is quite large compared to the distance between the two slits. So this is exaggerated in this picture. Let me change that to an L. So now we use what's called the small angle approximation. And the small angle approximation occurs in that if this angle theta is very small, we will find that tan theta is approximately the same as sine theta. So therefore, you could rewrite tan theta, if you look at here, as x over L is approximately equal to sine theta, which is equal to that path difference delta R all over D where delta r is basically m lambda over d. And so therefore, x is approximately equal to m lambda l over d. And we put a little m by the x because it could be for the first order, the second order, or the third order, depending on what you're looking for. So this is shown down below, and this is listed on the AP formula sheet. So once again, you can use this without proof. And if they list this on the formula sheet, so I would assume that in most problems, we're going to assume that the angle is much smaller. So we're going to assume that to the distance from the screen to the slits is quite large. And similarly, if you wanted to use the same formula for destructive interference, then we have this also for a small angle approximation. And you can modify this formula and just simply change the m to m plus a half. And then insert that into the formula. And it would be the same thing, except we're looking for the dark fringes in this particular case. So this distance x, by the way, is the position of the bright fringes on the screen, but it also can be referred to as the spacing between the fringes. So a lot of times you'll get questions that ask you, how, what, how could you change the spacing between the fringes? What kind of variables could you do? Could you affect? You could change the wavelength. For example, if you increase the wavelength of the light, that will increase the, the spacing between the fringes. You could increase the distance between the screen to the slits, L, and that would also increase the spacing. Or you could decrease the distance between the two individual slits. Uh, and that will increase the spacing between the fringes. So also know how to use this equation and understand the relationships between these three variables. And the last thing I'll talk about is the intensity of a double slit interference pattern. Um, you may recall that what we talked about as you, the intensity of the light varies uh, proportional to the square of the wave's amplitude, and then as you get further away from the slits, the intensity dies out. So let's take a look at the previous diagram up above here and show you what the intensity pattern will look like for this pattern if we were to graph this. So what we want to look at is what does the light intensity vary with the position x or y uh, we'll say x because that's consistent with what we're using. And so where is the brightest fringe? And hopefully you'll notice that in the middle will be the brightest fringe. So you'll get this big bright fringe right in the center. And this 
part right here and here will correspond to the dark bands that you see. And then as you move away from the center, that bright fringe, next bright fringe, decreases in intensity. And this, so this would be the next order right in here. So right here would be m equals 1 or negative 1. And this is, again, the central band, m equals 0. And then as you get further out here to the next bright fringe, it then decreases again as you move away from that central fringe. Here is m equals 2 bright fringe, or m equals negative 2. Or you could just call them both m equals 2. So hopefully you'll notice that the intensity of the light decreases as you go away. And these places where it's touching down here would refer to the positions where there is darkness. So now I believe you're ready to tackle on some interference problems. So I'll move on to the next example.